The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, hello, everybody out there. It is about 1 o'clock right now. We still have some folks that are continuing to find their seats, as it were, coming into today's webinar. We're going to give them about 60 seconds. We'll be starting up in just about a minute. Hello everyone out there. Welcome to today's presentation. This is the seventh webinar put on uh, in uh, uh, yeah, between TransFinder and NAPT, uh, their partnership uh, working together to put together this uh, webinar series. We're starting off with the, today's uh, presentation, the first part of a multi-part presentation on a return to school roadmap. My name is Andrew Hamilton. I'm the Senior Application Specialist with TransFinder Corporation, and I'm going to be in the GoToWebinar control panel, keeping an eye on the questions section. And that's a little something about today's presentation, is that you're going to be able to see and hear us over here, but we're not going to be able to see or hear you. Now, we want you to take advantage of the fact that this is an interactive discussion panel, especially at the end. So please do use the questions section of the GoToWebinar control panel to communicate any questions or concerns that you have with our panelists. Now, with that being said, what are we going to be doing today? Well, today we're going to start off with a few words from the TransFinder president and CEO, Antonio Civitella. And then we're going to uh, have an introduction and maybe a few additional words uh, from, Mark, from Mike Martin, the executive director of NAPT. We'll move on to a bit of a presentation, about 20 minutes, our return to school roadmap. And then we'll wrap up today with a panel discussion. So as our slide promises here, I'd like for you to give a welcome to the TransFinder president and CEO, Tony Civitella, for a few words. Take it away, Tony. Well, thank you, and uh, thank you for the introduction. Thank you to everyone. And by the way, happy, happy Cinco de Mayo at everybody across the country. So welcome to the, today's webinar. Uh, this is our seventh, seventh best practices webinar that we've held in partnership with NAPT. Uh, like uh, Andy said, this is the return to school roadmap, which is really part of the going back to school before the kids get to school, right? So it's part of that. And uh, again, school district across the country. Uh, I think there was just a lot of things going on here, especially how a, a lot of you are asking at this point, like, all right, what happens? What, what do we need to do when the doors do open at the school? What are the things? And, and a lot of you guys out there are asking for the specifics. Okay, what's, what do we need to do now for these, these doors open? And by the way, it really could tell that you guys are looking for this information and really trying to gather the specifics that today we had almost I think 800 registered people for this event and I think uh, so far I was looking at we are well over 500 already came on board I'm sure we're already going to hit some records here so uh, registered 800 and we're climbing I bet by the time I'm done talking we'll have over 600 that are live watching us so it's amazing it's a record and I feel like every week I'm saying it's another record, it's another rec record. But because it's a multi-part series, I wanna make sure you know, we just keep providing you tons of specifics. And I'm telling you, I know that today you're gonna go, holy cow, I wish I wish Billy saw this webinar. You're probably thinking, man, you missed a good one, Billy, or wherever your colleague. Well, guess what? You go on transfunder.com, and by the end of this week, this webinar is gonna be there live, you know, obviously it's recorded. So I encourage you to let your colleagues know, like, man, next Tuesday, same time, 1 p.m. Eastern time, 10 a.m. West Coast, Pacific time, it's Tuesday. It's going to be every Tuesday, we're going to have another series. I 
again, to give more details. And again, this is based on what you're saying. So it's best practices. It's, it's anchored off our website at transfer.com. We have so many recordings. We're doing so many webinars, so many best practices. Please just keep sending at it. We're really, it's almost that web page became a, a massive uh, amount of data. So I praise all you guys for really being the leaders in this industry and leaders in your community and really national level. And I'm really, I gotta tell you how the way you continue to work within your community, say what you're doing and, and, the, and the news and the messages that we're getting is just really, it's, it's overwhelming and I'm impressed every single day. So I wanna keep thanking you guys for doing what you're doing and I'm, I'm pleased to be uh, working with you guys. Mike Martin, thank you again for really for your leadership you've shown to, to this really the entire country. Uh, NAPT has really been uh, an organization that completely just stepped up at such a high level. So again, thank you that how you're leading this industry. And uh, again, Mike, I can't say enough how, how honored we are to partner with you guys with this really awesome information. So Mike, and thank you. So stop talking. So I want to tell myself, I got a little note, like enough talking because we got to get to this uh, to this uh, information that we want to disseminate to everybody, all right? Great, I'll be in the background checking out some questions and I'm sure I'll have some good stuff. I'll, I'll ask my own questions. So thank you again, Mike. Grazie, Antonio, appreciate it. Good afternoon, everyone. As the current health crisis continues to play out across the United States, collectively, we have experienced a disruption to the nation's educational system like never before. The coronavirus adds a huge new layer of complexity to our work. We still don't know all the ramifications, but we share a common commitment to try our best and reopen schools efficiently and with public confidence. Taxpayers realize COVID-19 is a situation we have never faced before as a nation, so they expect fresh thinking about the totality of education issues, especially the challenges that affect the health and safety of children. Since the yellow school bus brings more than half of K-12 students in America, to and home from school each day, taxpayers have very high expectations of us. Our work will involve much uncertainty and perhaps even risk, but we believe by working together, we can build outward from the uncertainty to identify the most reasonable steps needed to succeed. In fact, we must do so because avoiding missteps will be especially important in meeting parental and community expectations and maintaining trust. These are extraordinary times demanding extraordinary leadership. And it is my pleasure today to introduce to you two extraordinary leaders who have put together for your use and your discussion a roadmap for a return to school. Brad Amasegger is the, is the NAPT Region 3 Director and is also the Transportation Director for the, for the Toledo, Ohio Public Schools. Good afternoon, Brad. Thank you. Joining Brad is Jim Regan, uh, another longtime friend of NAPT and a, and a stalwart industry consultant uh, who is based out of the Chicago, Illinois area. Good afternoon, Jim. Thank you. Uh, right. It's now my pleasure to turn it over to the two of them who will give you a short presentation on a return to school roadmap. A little background history for Toledo Public Schools. We're about 24,000 students, uh, bus ridership about 10,000. We service um, 50 some school buildings. I have a budget just in the transportation department of about 15 mil. Our entire yellow school bus fleet is about 170 vehicles, including spares. And I have approximately 275 employees that work underneath me. Go ahead, Andy. Little Public Schools has been compliant with the state of Ohio governor's orders. On three separate occasions, he's closed schools for basically a month, then he extended it, and then the final decision was to close for the rest of the school year. While nothing is certain with regards to the fall, our current assumption is schools are gonna open up. We just don't know what that's gonna look like when they open up. If you look at social distancing, um, all the students can't come back to school at the same time. Um, the school district administration requested all the directors of every department to look at what a work order would look like, um, what requirements we need in, the, in our readiness plan. 
Our focus of the readiness plan and the roadmap on COVID-related practices follows. Next. Go ahead, Andy. I'm gonna turn it over to James Regan, uh, my colleague, to take over the next few slides. Uh, good afternoon, every morning, or maybe good morning in California. Um, Brad and I like to say, um, if you can't draw it, you don't understand it. And so there'll be a couple of visualizations in the course of the presentation. Um, consider it sort of a whiteboard, the results of a whiteboard session. But uh, when we were asked to put together a return to work requirements, um, we had to think about uh, the requirements of a number of constituencies. Uh, the administration has some requirements, the parents would have some. Um, we're looking at uh, tiers, tier districts uh, in the state of Ohio and across the US. Uh, Brad's staff has some requirements. Um, he's unionized, so he has a union contract he has to comply with and is gonna to have to comply with state and federal agencies as well. So we were looking at all the constituencies and, and trying to package this into a set of requirements. And the purpose of the requirements was twofold. Uh, the first to uh, inform the district of some policy decisions we needed them to make uh, to support a return to work. And those policy decisions going up on the graph would obviously infect the operational side of the school bus. The other part of it is that the return to work requirements would also inform our COVID readiness plan for the district. Uh, the readiness plan uh, consisted of, and you'll find this out in more detail, kind of fleet, some new safety SOPs for drivers, students, staff, and management. We looked at the COVID impact on the facility, on parent communications, on training, on management, and on testing. Uh, once school opens, um, it goes from a readiness plan to managing compliance, and that will become a new discipline in terms of how we manage inspections, testing, and monitoring you know, the, the COVID progress or lack thereof, hopefully, uh, throughout your school district. On the top, once school opens, you're still managing your, your business day to day. But uh, so what you're gonna hear in the roadmap is uh, kind of a look at the policy decisions uh, and the readiness plan with just a, a, few, a few thoughts on operations to begin with. Okay, Andy, go ahead. Okay, let's take a look at some operations. Uh, Brad and I have worked together for a while. And so you know, we know schools will be different. Um, but we looked at two scenarios primarily in looking at return to work. Um, the first scenario was that social distancing will be applied across the district. Um, we're hearing that in industries, um, you know, whether it's commercial, government, or school districts, but you know, social distancing seems to be a common denominator. If they choose to do social distancing across the district, it will reduce class size. And then if you reduce class size, there's only a limited number of scheduling options, uh, despite all of our brainstorming. One is they split schedules by grade, or they can split schedules by class, or possibly they could have a six day work week or six day school week with alternative days for school groups. But the notion was that when Brad and I looked at this, the bottom line is that the route design and mapping is gonna continue because the design routes, you know, the way they're designed are probably gonna run the same, only with lower ridership and maybe a different schedule. But you know, we're still taking the same students to a given school, and the variables are really who rides and when. And assuming that if they split uh, the schedule in some way, your ridership will be lower, uh, you probably have to space the students out on the bus possibly three to a combined row, that's two seats. So you got one in each seat and maybe one in the middle in the aisle seat in, a, in, in an alternate, alternating by row. The notion is that Brad and I are thinking that we'll operate the full route to start you know, the school to ensure coverage. But we do know that there'll be a lot of students, a lot of empty stops. And so after about four weeks, we can optimize the routes, um, you know, maybe just save some labor and mileage within the, within the routing network. Go ahead, Andy. 
uh, you know, kind of another visualization slide. So, you know, if they chose a social distance overview, they could split it by grade and have you know, K to four from seven to 12, and grades five to eight from 12 to five. Um, there'd be a standard, you know, we'd run the standard routes, we would run twice, obviously, and we look to optimize in week four. Uh, Brad and I are starting to put together the budgetary impact, and we'll have that ready for the next presentation, by the way. But we knew now that it's twice the mileage, twice the fuel, uh, probably twice the prevent, twice, twice the PNs, and twice the labor cost. There's also twice the driver risk, since the driver's out on the road four times a day instead of twice. Um, there could be up to twice the cleaning. If you're running uh, double runs, the question is, do you clean the buses once or twice a day? Uh, if a driver is absent, you're going to lose them on a double, uh, so it's twice the impact. And just running uh, buses longer in the daytime, you actually have less time for maintenance. So if you split the schedule by class size and you take half a third grade class in the morning and half in the afternoon, uh, the impact is still the same. If you run a six-day school week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday for one group, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday for another, your assumption is we'll have a longer school day. But we'll run the standard routes, we'll run them once a day for six days. And again, looking to optimize in about the fourth week, adding an extra day to the schedule adds 20% to your mileage, 20% to your fuel, 20% to your PMs, and 20% to your labor. Since you're running the route once a day, you still have your standard driver risk. You'll have daily cleaning, and if someone's absent, the impact is just kind of a normally, and you'll still have time in the day for maintenance. Go ahead, Danny. The, the other option, getting a little more creative, and we think this is somewhat viable, is there, you know, social distancing could be applied a la carte, meaning that's based on the number of infections at a given location. Right now, we know that all the states are doing kind of their own thing. So each school, like the state, have its own plan. And the district would invest in infrastructure to support activities at school to minimize the infections. And that could include mandatory wearing of masks, temperature taking, uh, isolation rooms for infected students. You'll see in the picture from the Taiwan classroom, they actually produced uh, desk barriers uh, those are those yellow things around the desk, hand washing stations, probably lunches in the classrooms, and they're talking about staggered bus arrival and departure schedules at varying entrances to keep the kids as far apart as possible. You know, if the, you know, if the cases are below a threshold at a school, the district could conceivably run the schools with some minor variations. If cases rise above the threshold at a given school, and what I described previously, scenario one could be activated until the cases drop and then come back to scenario two. And Brad and I think that school reopening plans will vary by state, by district, and now we're thinking it could be very possibly by school. But we know that not, you know, there's not one size that fits all, and we know there's a lot of people from a lot of states and a lot of different size districts, but hopefully what we're doing today will be a boilerplate uh, for you to start your thinking. Go ahead, Andy. So here's what it looks like on scenario two. Um, you know, if, if the district has you know, a low number of cases, you might run a regular schedule uh, with some drop-off boarding variations. Um, you know, you'll run your standard routes one time, you'll optimize as required, and you'll probably run it close to your budget and mileage to LPMs and labor. The drivers would have a normal risk to pick up the kids in the morning and the afternoon. We still have our daily cleaning you know, absence, which can be managed and you have time for maintenance. However, if one school in a route set, if you're running double routes, uh, goes above that threshold, then you're gonna end up with a hybrid schedule uh, where one school, maybe because of the number of cases, um, you know, runs a regular schedule, but a hybrid could be split. And hybrid routes would run on sort of on on-demand schedules, and then they'd be optimized as needed. And again, these hybrid schedules may only operate until a school number of uh, cases drop down below the threshold. But in this case, you have variable mileage, variable fuel, variable PMs, and variable labor. Um, depending on the number of routes and runs, you'd have variable driver risk. Um, 
probably still daily cleaning. You'd have moderate absent impact and you'd have variable time for maintenance because some of the day would be eaten up running routes. But a sound routing system is required for both scenarios. I think if you have a good routing system, uh, you can adapt it. But I think Brad and I, you know, we're starting to prepare for volatility. But um, so let's go, let's go down a little more detail and let's review the elements that form the baseline of Toledo's readiness plans. Go ahead, Andy. Uh, the first step, uh, as indicated uh, in the original diagram, was we wanted to look at policies that may be required. So again, through a whiteboard exercise, we have a list of policy requirements that you know, Brad feels that he needs for a smooth return to work transition. The priority is based on the lead time required to manage the policy outcome. You know, for example, class size and schedule are at the top because they impact routing, which most of you will be starting in May for the following school year. So you'll see you know, what we'd like, and Brad and I will be engaging with the administration to try to get a decision on class size and schedule in May. We have to know what the administration and the board wants in terms of compliance. Uh, it could be CDC, it'll be Ohio Department of Health. There could be some additional district requirements. So we need a list of all the things we have to comply to both for the staff and the students. And those things we're looking to get some direction by May. Um, then in June, as we get closer to the school year, uh, we're gonna need some policies on post-infection process for student and staff. If a student uh, who's determined to have the virus on a bus, uh, the question is, you know, uh, are you, you know, the tracking of that, are all the kids going to have to be quarantined for two weeks? Will the driver have to be quarantined for two weeks? Um, what's going to be the process uh, post-infection? Uh, there's other things um, in order to relieve the uh, or to ease the driver flow at the facility. We're looking at early check-in for drivers, which impacts Brad's CBA agreement. Uh, we're going to pay for drivers to check in earlier and have a longer window for checking in. If a driver gets infected by a student, we need some clarity on staff time benefit um, as we go forward so the driver, drivers know that they're protected. Another big thing, as you'll see in the newspapers as well, is the daycare relationship policy. In Toledo, um, Brad drops off at daycares, um, but you know, if daycares are not open, um, it's going to make things a little more interesting. So we're looking for some guidance on the relationship between Toledo Public Schools and the daycares in the city. We'll need some updates on policies relation to SPED students and the handling of SPED students. Uh, all of Brad's high school students are transported by a public transit agency, TARDA. Uh, they could be governed by the DOT and maybe they'll have a different set of requirements, uh, but we'll have to get in alignment with the public transit agency so that you know, we have one set of requirements for high school students that are aligned. And then for compliance reasons, we'll have student and probably staff discipline policy updates uh, to say what happens if someone's not in compliance with all of the above new policies. So that's kind of a list of 13 policies that we felt that the board and the administration would be responsible uh, to give Brad in order that he has the proper direction uh, to start schools. Uh, actually, when this call's over, Brad and I had a conversation uh, with the administration to go over this list. Next slide. Thanks, Andy. So I'm going to turn it back to Brad. Um, Brad's going to go through some of the planning exercises and some of the things we had to put in place uh, to start the planning. So, Brad, it's over to you. Next slide, Andy. So when we built the return to work plan, we had three attributes we were looking at. Compliance, so we have to be compliant with the federal government, state, and our district guidelines. Uh, second one, agility. We need an environment that is fluid, that we're gonna be able to make changes on the go. Just because we've set up policies that we need in May and June right now, maybe we need them even sooner. Maybe we needed them last week, we don't know. This is an area where Nobody has any answers. We're, we're trying to figure it out as we go. So you have to be very fluid. Um, and sustainability. You can't just assume that there's gonna be a host of new practices and boom, off you go. You're gonna need to be fluid to the point where what you thought would work this month isn't gonna work next month. And you've gotta be able to come up with a way 
to make those changes. Go ahead, Andy. So what Jim and I did, we started to look at industry practices. Uh, school bus world, when you look at it, um, we're transportation. So we started to look at what other industries that are already starting to open up, what did they do and what could we steal from them to use for us? So when you look at comparing New York City with their number of deaths to a small county in Texas that had zero deaths, it's totally different how New York's gonna open up compared to that small county in Texas. Where I met here in Ohio, we're one of the top three county, counties for, for COVID deaths in the state. So for me to open up and look at social distancing is gonna be a lot different than maybe a rural community in a different county. Um, key guidance areas are, are the CDC, your federal government, your state, your local government, all your health departments. And for me, it's the Ohio Department of Education. What is your state education department gonna require you when you open up? Um, a lot of these entities, um, school specific, they haven't been able to give us any answers, but we can't wait for a specific answer. We've gotta come up with plans on what we're gonna do. Your operational readiness, it's not, if something's going to happen, you have to plan this will happen. You have to be ready for that. When you look at community sentiment, um, sentiment, we can build the best thing to transport kids. But if the parents aren't willing to put their kids on the bus to go to school, we don't know. You know, we could have the best laid plans, um, all the great policies, but we don't know what the parents are going to do. Go ahead, next slide. Hey Brad, can I add something here? Uh, before sure. that? Uh, in the state of Wyoming, um, and if anyone's online from Wyoming, uh, you can probably verify this, but there are some states that all the school districts have to submit their reopening and readiness plans uh, to the State Department of Education for approval. Um, so we don't know whether that's gonna be in Ohio, but by having uh, a work plan and having this readiness plan, we're prepared uh, if, if the Ohio Department of Education wanted to centralize and request all the districts to submit plans for them to review before they release them. So there are some states that are becoming a little more centralized. Um, that's out there in the real world as well, and Wyoming's the case in point. Thanks, Brad. All righty. So when Jim and I started to make discussions on how are we gonna open up and, and how are we gonna be ready, we, we dove down and figured there were three major areas that we have to be concerned with. One was your school administration. Um, is the plan gonna address admissions uh, risk perception and, and readiness criteria? For us in the yellow school bus industry, drivers are a huge staff problem. No matter what we put in place, are our drivers going to come back to work? You know, we hire a lot of elderly individuals that have health conditions um, and are more susceptible based on the current studies. Are they going to come back to work? Is this going to be a job they want to continue to do? And the last one were, were our parents. If we don't instill a confidence in our parents that the school system and the transportation department are ready to protect their children um, and their safety, will they come back? Are they gonna attend school? Are we gonna end up with another few thousand cars on the road just transporting their kids to school? And how are we gonna deal with that? Um, next slide. Go ahead, Andy few slides. They're just the um, links, um, CDC, federal guidelines. Next slide. State guidelines, another uh, website. Go ahead. Next slide. So our ready, readiness program overview. Go back one, Andy. There you go. Jim and I looked at it and we're gonna go into a lot of detail next week, but we looked at eight main areas that we had to address to be ready to open school from the transportation perspective. 
um, our facility requirements. How are we going to have individuals come into the building? Currently, all of my staff comes into one central building. They clock in, they clock out, they receive all their documents and their keys. How are we going to control social distancing with that? Um, vehicle requirements. Um, State of Ohio is very strict on what can be installed in a vehicle in the process to, that you have to go through to make any alter, alterations whatsoever. Um, driver safety, are we gonna have enough PPEs on site for everybody? Student safety requirements, is the district gonna have a policy where all students wear a uh, face mask? And if the student shows up at the stop without a face mask, um, is the driver gonna have the authority to deny a ride? And then if that child's left at the stop and the parent thinks they're on the bus, the, the issues you're gonna deal with are shop safety, uh, being able to maintain our maintenance program and, and sharing tools and working the shifts that we currently do. Department management requirements with all the new regulations, how are we going to manage the staff that they're following all the new standard operating procedures? Additional fleet requirements. Um, we all know what it's like to try to order in additional vehicles. Is funding gonna be there? How long it takes? So there has to be flexibility there on how we transport students if additional buses need to be put on the road. And then finally, your parent and community requirements. What, what is the community gonna expect from us? And are we communicating with the community all the safe um, requirements that we've got for our staff? Go ahead, next one. Next slide, Andy. There you go. Jim? Yeah. Well, as Brad said, what we did, and I know you can't read this, but um, this is in a Excel sheet, and this will be sent to everybody. Um, this presentation, the presentation from next week, and this will be sent to you after this is over. But this is just a snapshot of the implementation timeline, and each line in this is a separate activity. Uh, we built it on a 12-week project calendar. Uh, because that carries us to the first week of August. Um, and I think what we did, as Brad said, we took every role uh, in his staff. So and we walked through that person's shoes. So a driver shows up at the lot, the first thing he does is goes to the facility. So we, you know, there's a section on all the facility requirements as Brad talked about. Um, a little more detail, we're establishing, a, we have to close the driver room and so and then we have to manage the flow through the building things like managing ventilation are some of the tasks are you going to have to have a testing and temperature desk uh, at your facility to be in compliance with cdc so we walked you know, through the driver and what the driver would walk through as he came through the facility then we went on to his bus uh, the cleanliness of the bus um, even down to the point if a mechanic was doing maintenance on the bus to clean the bus after he even returns it to its sparking space uh, in the lot and uh, and managing the, the, fleet, the fleet cleanliness, uh, the technology for um, not just cleaning, but disinfecting is changing as well. So all of this you'll see in the calendar. Uh, Brad is doing some work over the summer. Uh, he has some uh, vehicles doing some Wi-Fi work. Um, and so he has a few buses operating. So some of the practices and CDC compliances are been put in place already. That's where you see the red lines that go from left to right. Um, the, about the fourth column in is, you know, is when all the policies could be implemented in May. But as we get closer to the school year, more and more of the activities become implemented and become activated as we get closer uh, to the routes being designed and you know, assigning them to drivers and doing their dry runs and things of that nature. Thanks, Andy. Let's go to the close. Basically, in a summary, um, you can start now. Uh, if you read the CDC guidelines um, and you think that will apply, you can start developing new SOPs now. Um, we have to identify the longest lead time items and make them a priority. Uh, after we close the driver lounge, uh, we walk through all the offices and a lot of the desks were more than, you know, we're not we're within six feet of each other so we got to move some workstations 
to maintain workplace social distancing, which we think will be a requirement. That can be done now. You gotta start, you know, you gotta start working with your administration now <laughs> to get some clarity on the needed policies. And again, policies on student size and schedule are critical. Um, COVID management will be a new discipline. Brad and I, every morning, one of the first things we do is we Google, you know, business reopening and school reopening every day, uh, looking for new practices uh, that we might apply at Toledo. Um, but, you know, whatever the plan is, it's going to change as answers and new questions are developed, uh, and the plan will adapt. So what we're doing now is we'll open it up to Q&A, but this presentation will be shared. Um, if you'd like, you can make some comments on the presentation. Send your ideas back to Mike Martin at NAPT or any of the practices you're thinking of doing. Uh, they will compile the results and we'll try to make this a living document. We'll also share the Excel sheet. And we'll also share the presentation from next week in advance so you can look at some of the, you know, some of the stuff in more detail and have more questions, right, you know, and more questions ready. So on behalf of Brad and I, thank you. And I turn it back over to our moderator for Q and A. Thank you so Thank much, you. Chairman yeah. Brad. That was phenomenal. Um, Andy, you can advance the next slide. Um, there, I just want to let you know, first of all, uh, the feedback. Just so you know, in case you're wondering if you hit a nerve um, or if you're delivering the goods, you definitely did. Many, many people wanting to make sure. So you guys have already said it multiple times, but we'll say it as well. Um, this whole presentation will be available. I, there's going to be an email that will go out to all the uh, attendees, and there also will be um, it will also be on our uh, transfinder.com site, anchored to our homepage. Before I get into my first question, I want to just read a couple quick things just from what's happening across the country, and I want to ask uh, Brad and Jim a quick question. Um, there's a story uh, yesterday. Idaho's governor, Brad Little. He recently changed the criteria for reopening school. Now he says that unless schools can do it with groups of less than Idaho students should generally not expect that their schools are gonna be reopened this academic school year. Um, meanwhile, in Montana, there is a little school there that's gonna be the first classroom to reopen um, this year, this school year. Um, it's been closed for nearly two months. Very small, 56 students. 18 staff members this Thursday will enter the Willow Creek School, uh, going against the advice of some education officials and also against the grain of a vast majority of US schools that plan to remain closed. I think 45 states and DC are closed for the remainder of the school year. But the superintendent says her parents are the ones driving that. Three quarters of the parents are saying, please open the schools before the end of the school year so there's some sense of normalcy. And then finally in Texas, this is again, just a swath of uh, our country, uh, Texas schools, it says, might start bringing students back to classrooms on a staggered basis in the fall, or they might have some students show up at school while others continue online coursework. And then the last sentence in this lead says, they might stay completely virtual until 2021. So that's the landscape that I think we're all facing. You guys definitely touched on a lot of the uncertainties and being flexible, and I wanna to touch on that in a second. But one of the things I just wanted to highlight, first of all, is you guys both, it sounds to me like you're saying to take some of the reins and be prodding your administration, which is what I really, I think is helpful for people who are watching and saying, instead of being passive and kind of waiting for things to come to you, you're saying the exact opposite, turn the equation and be active. Is that correct? Rick, um... I'll take it first. So if you don't have, it came up a couple sessions ago on these webinars. If you're not having those crucial conversations right now with your boss um, and whatever your relationship is with a board or your superintendent, you've got to do that now, if not weeks ago. Those crucial conversations, you'll be surprised um, how many administrators above your level haven't really thought about some of the questions that we raise as a transportation department. So at least it gets them thinking also. But when you look at transporting students, you, it's just not an off and on switch. So you've got to be proactive at this point and do something to be ready. It's the un 
you don't know what you're going to have. But if you just sit back and try to wait until the last minute when you get an answer, you're behind the eight ball and you don't have anything in place. Something's better than nothing is how I look at it. And I like what you said before. You said about you know, that quote from The Art of War. Don't plan as if the enemy's not coming. Be ready. The enemy's coming. Absolutely. Michael, you going to say something? Corollary question to that for both Brad and Jim. Um, when and how were you notified that you needed to present a plan? I mean, obviously, Brad, that's something that came from your either your school board or your superintendent. How much lead time did they give you? And and you know, uh, have you collaborated, for example, with other administrators in your school system? How has that played out for you? So a little history for Toledo Public. It's a very top-down driven decisions. Um, so I was raising questions, but not getting any answers or feedback. Um, I didn't know what direction to go to. So when I reached out to uh, Jim Regan, I said, hey, we got to come up with something. And then my boss scheduled a uh, department head meeting. And in that meeting, he just brought up, hey, I'm, I need a return to work plan. So my initial thought was I'd just dump off a couple little items to him. But when Jim and I started to speak more about what was going on and what we needed to look at, it was a snowball effect. For every question we had, there was another two or three questions that that compiled. And um, I'll turn it over to Jim for some more specifics, but it, it snowballed into what we, we highlighted today and more detail next week. Yeah, I, I guess it's gonna be, and, and Rick, you mentioned all the you know, variable scenarios out there. Um, you know, I, I think we just wanted to get uh, a picture of the landscape. And we understood that, you know, at some point, you, the starting point was we're going to build the routes anyway. Um, we know that if, if schools open in some format, you know, you're going to have to get the eligible students who want to be on a school bus to school. Now, the ridership may be way down because parents will take their kids, but you know that whole question of equity and getting kids to a learning environment uh, becomes important. So one of the basics was, you know. You know, we're going to route and we're going to put, you know, as many, you know, we're going to take the kids and we're going to plan on getting them to school. Now, the schedule will change, uh, whether it's like a split schedule or a six day schedule. Um, if they imply social distancing, hopefully, you know, half them, we'd only have half the number of kids on a bus so they can maintain some social distancing on a bus. Brad and I had a conversation with Mike the other day about is it possible to put a screen, like a vertical screen with face mask material between the seats, you know, it's not just, uh, you know, to, to allow more protection for the students. So we were, we were still brainstorming uh, on the assumption that in some, you know, in some hybrid format, uh, they may decide to have, you know, classrooms for four hours a day and then online the rest of that. So that means we're still bringing kids to school. So whether it's a hybrid, or like in Montana, you know, it's all in, a uh, kid going to school, or if they stay virtual, there is no transportation, uh, but at least we're ready. Brad, uh, I have another question for you. Um, if, what, and again, this, this clearly took you more than a couple of days to put this together, right? This is, this is a massive undertaking right here and, 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 and impressive on top of that. What should someone do right now if they're, if they're three, three weeks, right? What should someone do right now if they haven't yet been notified? You mentioned your really top down system and you, you, know, you were proactive. How should, what would be your general recommendation to someone who hasn't yet been notified uh, and, and, and will likely be expected to present something like this? So the first thing they need to do, whoever they report to directly, depending on where that is in your administrative chain, they need to reach out to them and they need to ask those questions. If school opens up, whatever date that is, what do you need from me? And if they can't give you those answers, then that individual from the transportation department needs to give them, this is the list of questions that I have for you. What time is school gonna start? How many kids are going to be in a classroom? Those those you need to do now. I, I love it, it. It depends on when your school starts. If you're looking at a July start, you're you need to get going quick and 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 be that be that pain. If they don't get those answers, continually follow up emails, right. phone calls. I, I'm known as the past. 
I'm known as the pest in the office because you know when I'm you know I'm the director of public relations at Transfinder. I forgot to introduce myself. If anybody's wondering, um, and uh, so you have to pest. You can't just send an email or leave a voicemail and think that's enough. You have to say, "Oh, here uh, I see Rick's number on my phone again. I better just either answer it or get my answer, you know, ready to give it to him." So you have to stay on top of it. Not only that, but it also protects yourself because no one can say. That you weren't proactive you can say no i have a trail here where i've been asking you for you know those specific questions um so one question i thought this was really fascinating and you're you're the first ones that i've seen and we've done lo a lot of these webinars now you mentioned in this the idea of social distancing applied a la carte based on the, your actual school district um you know governors are doing this i think a little bit by their states what areas are harder hit than others you're saying to actually apply that approach even within the school district. Um, so my question is, um, will you need to have almost, will schools, at least in some areas, have to create almost like a task force, a Navy SEAL type group that is so, in, that crosses disciplines to know what the makeup of their school district is and, and be able to be that fluid uh, group that you mentioned before. Your thoughts on that? Go ahead, Jim. Yeah. Um, you look at airlines. Uh, airlines are boarding two or three hundred people at a time, and now they're starting to take temperatures of everybody who boards. Um, you know, you look at some of uh, Amazon and other companies' manufacturing plants. They're testing everybody who comes into the plant. Um, so when you look at the commercial side of the house, um, the testing. And, I mean, and the temperature doesn't indicate there's the thumb test and the, there's four or five different tests that I guess that are involved. But our assumption is that there's going to be some significant testing um, to identify how many cases actually would exist uh, within a certain school population. Um, and when you look at the investment, um, if you want to invest in having a split schedule, the economics become very interesting. If you had to have all your teachers run the same class twice, your labor costs coming from a district are going to go through the roof. It's not sustainable. So I think some boards may opt to, to try to maintain the integrity of the current system and invest in you know, uh, you know, the infrastructure and social distancing in the classroom, those uh, desk shields, uh, testing, isolation rooms, um yeah you know, there could be a case that if you do everything else right and maybe you can come close to running school on a regular basis and if a school does go above the threshold you close that school just like they're closing beaches in california one beach at a time because so many people came to that one beach do you think do you think that there'll be any need to be a task that, can get, Rick, you know i'm sorry do you think that there would need to be a though i mean like Who's going to be watching all this? Is it going to be just the administration, or do you think there needs to be a unique group that's going to actually be formed that is staying up to date with the latest information on your specific region? I, I think the testing will be done in cooperation with some local health agency. I don't see it being full, I don't see it being the full domain of the of, of the school district. I think uh, uh, kind of a collaborative of municipalities uh, of, of municipal departments. Brad. The scary, the scary part I saw in the news this morning, they were mentioning possibly 3,000 deaths a day. And it made me think about, are we in a war situation that 3,000 deaths a day is okay? So when in one of our slides, we mentioned that we look at private business on what they're doing if you look at your state and you look at what your state requires, the private businesses that are opening up during their phase one or whatever they call it, what are they requiring from those businesses to open up? And how successful is that? To me, if the state isn't looking at those openings and trying to compare it to educating students and what they're gonna do with schools, we're all gonna be in trouble when schools open up. If they try to do something different with, thousands of kids reporting to school systems and buildings, who knows what's gonna happen. Hey, so Rick, can I, I have a question nice. directly from the, um, from the uh, attendees here, and I wanna get to a couple of specifics here, and then um, 
And Mike, did you have a question? I'm sorry. I did. Well, I had one more on, on this general topic, right? What, one of the things we've heard over the course of the last three or four weeks uh, uh, in other webinars is that you have a, a deep well of talent within your department, not just your school system and or your community. Um, who else? Ha has, has this entire process been something that just the two of you developed? Or have you dipped down into your talent pool within the department and or the school? Uh, excuse me, enter the school system to kind of seek some additional resources. Have you had uh, the school nurse, uh, any other uh, local health officials involved in, in your planning or discussions? This predominantly has been um, research on our parts. Um, we're unique. When I've reached out to, um, Jim's raised the same type of questions. And when I've tried to reach out to those individuals, their response back was, we thought about it, but we don't have any answers. Okay. So to me, transportation people, hey, give us, give us whatever little direction you can, we'll make it work. We'll take that square peg and put it <laughs> in the front hole. So we just took it and ran. Hey, Mike, uh, here's a question from, I'm sorry. Just look at this. Um, that's why the policy part is so important. Right. Because once a board approves a policy, then we can go to the school nurse, we can go to the departments, and it becomes policy deployment. So now you're on the downhill side. Thank right you. now we're on the uphill side, trying to get the policies approved. But once they're approved, you know, Brad has the clout to saying, I'm implementing the board policy, give me what I need. Okay. So to follow up just a sec, there was a slide that Jim covered, and he mentioned that this is what we have a meeting with my superior. I report to the deputy superintendent, and we literally have a meeting at 2.30 to go over what we gave you guys today. Excellent. And so we're constantly, we're moving ahead, but like Jim said, if these policies aren't put in place, they're way above my pay grade. They're at the board level and superintendent level. Those policies need to be put in place for me to be able to actually lock in what I need to do. By the way, I think a few people want to use your presentation and bring it literally before the board. They may just cut and paste uh, Toledo Public Schools out and put it in their own school district. There's a lot of content you guys have already, uh, you've given them all a huge uh, head start if they haven't done anything yet. Um, one person asked a question, Kathleen, you talked about um, taking temperatures a few times and she goes, obviously the laws and such have to do with a child. Basically, what would happen if a child had a temperature at the bus stop. So, um, you know, you can't leave a kid at the bus stop. So just those kind of things, have you thought about those kind of things and where does that fit into the strategy? That goes back to the policies. So if your district puts a policy in place, that's what that's the guidance you're gonna have. What, what I can't do when Jim and I first started to talk about this, we separated what policies could I put in place as the director and what policies need to be put in place at the superintendent and board level? A temperature one and refusing a ride, that's definitely a board policy. And Toledo Public Schools hasn't even adapted as a whole that they're going to take student temperatures. Yeah, there, yeah, one of the things, so there's some ADA have, guidelines on temperature taking, and the early indications are even with your staff, um, you know, with Brad has a union contract to deal with in terms of taking temperatures of staff, uh, not just the students. Uh, our assumption is that temperature will be done at the school. Um, maybe with special ed students where you have a bus aid, it might be feasible. Uh, but I think uh, when you look at driver safety, you want your drivers to come back. Um, you know, you, you know we, Brad and I have walked through how kids will be boarded. Uh, kids will have to go to the back of the bus and take the rear the rearmost seat so they're not passing each other during the aisle um, and so it's like first in last seat so we've gone into the details of boarding procedures uh, that would that, 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 that brad can implement himself but the, but the notion of you know how boarding does it uh, minimize interactions is all part of this so you really have to walk through every piece of your operation and put the shoes of the student on, put the shoes of the parent on, put the shoes of the driver on, and see it from their point of view, and then make your modifications. Uh, one of the uh, attendees, by the way, his school is in Toledo, Washington. He's just going to change the state. He's going to use your. <laughs> um, so 
what so another specific question what about employees who have already had COVID-19 or may get it this summer but then they're fully cured and then August comes around will they have to have a uh, use PPE? So those questions are still being had um every time i hear watch the news it's like they still can't determine if i have the antibodies that i've had it how long how long does that stay in your system is it any good so the health departments don't even have an answer to that question so Toledo public school specifically has not had any policies put in place that we're going to do any type of testing before we come back to work. Um, our governor basically has not required any testing except for our uh, frontline uh, health workers. So it's a lot of those, what's the governor of the state going to require and how that works down to a school district. That's good. You know, one thing I should highlight, and then I'll go to you, Mike, um, and I meant to mention this earlier about just the idea of communicating with your district uh, we haven't mentioned this uh today but you know span finder has made um available our stop finder uh communication app for free for any district that's just like a two-way communication i'm assuming there's going to be times you talked about brad just being fluid being flexible we keep hearing that over and over again you got to be flexible so there's going to be times when you're probably going to need to make instant communication um avail you know communicate with your district quickly so I just wanted to throw that out there. Just it's uh, stop finder communication. It's free, so we're not making anything out of it. It's just uh, as a tool to help communities stay connected with their district. Mike, not here. We're and again. Uh, first of all, thank you both very much for for all of this. But and as we discussed, uh, as we were getting ready for this um, webinar today, uh, you know, reminded us all of a, of a saying that we've all heard before. Right? Every every pizza is a personal pan pizza if you're determined enough and you have enough time. Um, you know, but you can't eat a pizza in one bite. So that, that's kind of what we decided to do with this for everyone's benefit. Um, this was a lot uh, today and there's a lot more to talk about. So do me a favor, if you would please, as kind of our final substantive point today, explain to everyone who's on the webinar right now where we go from here with this particular effort and this particular project. They'll get a copy, they'll all get a copy of today's presentation. Uh, they'll get a copy of the spreadsheet and what is it that we would like them to do with it and how do we transition from right now until a week from now uh i'll comment the i, I think mike you and i discussed um everyone's in different situations so uh, we want to sort of create a living document so that everyone can have some input and then we can share it back with everybody so when you get the spreadsheet particularly it's broken into those eight modules. And you can look at all the individual actions that Brad and I intend to take in each of those eight categories. Um, if, you, if you and your district say, hey, we have some additional ideas that we think uh, would be varied, just insert a bunch of lines, um, put in your ideas, and then email them back to you, Mike, and then we can work on consolidating all of that and integrating that next week. But the notion is that, hey, you know, Brad and I, you know, we have an answer for, and you know, we're working on a developing answer for Toledo Public Schools, um, but all of you have different situations. So I think the more people can contribute um, their thoughts to it, especially on the Excel sheet, and get that back to you, the more we can consolidate and, 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 and just really reflect what's going on in the country. Um, guys, I. I I can't believe how fast the time flew by. Um, I'm glad we're going to have you back next week. And I can I dare say that we're going to have you back two weeks out. Can we say we're going to have a three-parter? I'm going to put you on the spot. So, because uh, I think there's a lot of content, and um, you also want to talk about contractors in week three. So if that's okay, guys. I just put you on the spot. Um, but I think it's going to be great. Um, can we just can I ask you all for uh, starting with Jim and then Brad, Mike? I'm gonna to ask Tony to come back on for a uh, final takeaway and then I'll, I'll close this out. But Jim, what's the one thing you want someone to leave this webinar uh, taking back with them when they go back to their office? Um, yeah, by the way, feel free to use the presentation, number one. Uh, uh, when you look at the CDC um, and, and you look at, there's a lot of things you, you can do by yourself as a transportation director now, like Brad, we went through a whole host of things and we sorted them 
by could he do him and could he do it themselves within the transportation department or did he need wait wait for board approval so one is that as, as everyone brainstorms all the potential things they might do uh, sort by board approval and sort by you know department approval and get started on the department stuff right now super brad um ask those crucial conversations with your with your boss your superiors and for lack of a better word be that pest so if you don't get an answer in a couple days don't be afraid to pick up the phone or send another email that's right very good even camp outside their house if you have to <laughs> mr martin and i think uh, i think number three is, is understand that while this uh, is a template um it is it is a living document as jim alluded all right for for all intents and purposes we're kind of building this airplane in the air all of us frankly um and this is uh, one method which seemed to to all of us to make sense um it's incremental uh, it's logical it's detailed uh but don't by any stretch of the imagination assume that it's going to be a perfect fit for what you're doing so so there's going to be a necessity for active follow-up on this one okay if, if you are on the call today please join us again next week um and, and we're not do, saying that to just try to build attendance we really genuinely feel uh that we had to break this in too because there's so much here so we're going to give you a homework assignment in the middle do it and join us again next week that's awesome thank you mike tony are you on Hang on one second, I'm gonna have Tony and then I'm gonna say a couple of closing words. Tony, take away. Yes, I'm on, thank you guys. Listen, my biggest takeaway from today, and uh, I'm learning so much, is clearly it's process and procedure, right? That's really it. So you gotta have a solid one. I gotta tell you one thing that I learned even from last week is that, you know, you know our routing software, we, we think it's awesome, it's great, but guess what, it works with eligible students. I think one of the things I'd like to hear eventually is like, well, how do you ask parents? Like, are you, even though your kid's eligible, can you let us know if you're gonna let your kid get on the bus or not? Because that would change the outcome, right? Like think about our software is gonna create these gray routes, but we might have too many kids on the routes because we know that maybe some parents are gonna say, no, I don't want the kid to get us. Again, process and procedure, I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about that because I always think about it. No, routing software is going to create, it's all based on all who's eligible. But now, what if a parent say, even though I'm eligible, my kid's eligible, I'm going to figure out how to bring the kid there. So obviously, it's all part of that process and procedures. And wow, guys, there's so much, so much work. Thank you for the effort, too. So awesome. Thank you. One of the things that I, we, I love about this presentation is it really gets into the nuts and bolts. Um, it's not just a 40,000 degree uh, or 40,000 foot view. It's really getting into some really specifics. And uh, I think people have been craving specifics. So I just wanna thank you, Brad and Jim, for just a great presentation. The feedback again has really been tremendous. Mike, thank you again for your leadership and NAPT's leadership during this crucial time. I wanna highlight that if you do have a story um, out there, uh, school, any school district that's doing something unique, um, we really do want to capture all of these and make them into future webinars or put them on our best practices page because the bottom line is we're all learning from each other. I think that's been really clear. And so just send it to my story at transfinder.com and it may be included in a future webinar or on our best practices page. Now again, everybody mark your calendars for Tuesday, May 12th, 1 p.m. Eastern um, for the second part of this series, a return to school, um, a school roadmap. Um, and be sure and tell your, your colleagues, you, maybe even it's time to bring in your superintendent and say, listen to this webinar um, so that they are on the same page as you and you're on the same page as them. Again, if you have any questions, uh, you want to find this webinar, it'll be on transfinder.com later this week. And uh, you'll be getting an email from us as well with some details. So thank you again for coming, everybody. Thank you again, panelists. Have a great day. Take care. Peace, guys. Peace. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks.